Let's take it back to the beginning and talk about legendary mob boss Thomas Lucchese. Tommy was born on December 1, 1899 in Palermo, Sicily. In 1911, they immigrated to the United States, settling in Manhattan's East Harlem. Lucchese's father worked in cement hauling, while Tommy worked in a machine shop until an accident in 1915 led to the amputation of his right thumb and forefinger. In the early 1930s, the Lucchese family moved to Corona, Queens, residing at 118 Northern Boulevard. Tommy wasn't a tall person and was less confrontational. Tommy had three brothers, Joseph, Jimmy, and Nino, all of whom joined him in organized crime. He obtained U.S. citizenship in 1943 and married wife Catherine, with whom he had two children. Following his accident, Lucchese became more involved with the 17th Street Gang, a group notorious for arm robberies and burglary. Operating under the protection of Gaetano Tom Reyna, the boss of the Bronx East Harlem family. By 18, Lucchese established a window washing company in East Harlem, using intimidation tactics to secure business. He also frequented a political club in the area. By the early 1920s, Lucchese formed a close alliance with mobster Charlie Lucky Luciano and rose within Gaetano Reyna's crime family. Despite his criminal activities, Lucchese was only arrested six times during his career, with his first arrest in 1920 and the last in 1935. Remarkably, he never served a lengthy prison sentence. In 1920, Lucchese got arrested in Riverhead, Long Island for grand larceny involving a stolen car. During the booking process, a police officer noticed Lucchese's deformed hand and likened it to that of Mordecai Three Finger Brown, a famous Major League Baseball pitcher. This led to Lucchese being dubbed Three Finger Brown, a nickname he disliked. In January 1921, he was convicted of auto theft and sentenced to three years and nine months in prison, serving 13 months at Sing Sing Correctional Facility before being paroled. Surprisingly, this was Lucchese's only conviction. Upon his release in 1923, Lucchese re-entered a world transformed by prohibition. His associates, including Charlie Luciano, Frank Costello, and Meyer Lansky, had ventured into bootlegging, partnering with Jewish gangster Arnold the Brain Rothstein in the illegal alcohol trade. Lucchese encountered legal trouble once again, this time under the alias Thomas Ara, facing charges of receiving stolen goods. Then on July 18, 1928, he and his brother-in-law, Joseph Joe Palisades Rosado, were arrested for the murder of Luis Serrasuolo. However, these charges were later dismissed. Throughout his life, Lucchese faced three other arrests, in 1930 for murder, in 1931 for an investigation, and in 1935 for vagrancy. Remarkably, in all three instances, he was released and had all charges dropped. In early 1931, the Castella Marie's War erupted between Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. Luciano struck a secret deal with Maranzano, agreeing to orchestrate Masseria's demise in exchange for control over Masseria's operations and becoming Maranzano's second in command. On April 15, 1931, Luciano arranged a meeting with Masseria at Nuova Villa Tamaro restaurant on Coney Island where Masseria was assassinated during a card game. Allegedly, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel carried out the hit, with Ciro the Artichoke King Terranova as the getaway driver. Following Masseria's death, Luciano assumed control of Masseria's family, with Genovese as his underboss. However, Lucchese had warned Luciano of Maranzano's intention to eliminate him, prompting Luciano and Genovese to plot Maranzano's assassination. On September 10, 1931, Luciano, Genovese, and Frank Costello arranged a meeting with Maranzano, but instead sent four Jewish gangsters, unknown to Maranzano's men, to eliminate him. After Maranzano's murder, Luciano established the commission as the governing body for organized crime, abandoning the old boss-of-all-bosses structure. The commission recognized five crime families, each with its territory and operations, with Luciano as the primus inter pares, or first among equals. In 1951, following the natural death of Galliano, Tommy Lucchese, who had served as underboss and de facto street boss for two decades, seamlessly assumed leadership, prompting the renaming of the family to the Lucchese crime family. He appointed Stefano LaSalle as underboss and Vincenzo Rao as consigliere. Additionally, Lucchese forged an alliance with Vito Genovese, underboss of the Luciano crime family, and Carlo Gambino, underboss of the Anastasia crime family with the aim of eventually controlling the commission. Lucchese earned a reputation as one of the most respected Cosa Nostra bosses of the post-war era, cultivating close ties with New York City politicians. He prioritized core mafia values of profitability, maintaining a low public profile, and evading criminal prosecution. Under his leadership, the Lucchese family became dominant in Manhattan's garment district and the associated trucking industry by securing control over crucial unions and trade associations. Throughout the 1950s, Lucchese was involved in a drug network alongside Santo Traficante Jr., 
the boss of the Tampa crime family. This partnership stemmed from Lucchese's long-standing relationship with Traficante Jr.'s father, Santo Traficante Sr., whom Lucchese had mentored in mafia traditions during the 1940s. Traficante Jr. frequently dined with Lucchese in New York City, cementing their alliance. Tommy Lucchese became an American citizen in Newark, New Jersey. However, his citizenship faced scrutiny when, on November 17, 1952, U.S. Attorney General James P. McGranary initiated denaturalization proceedings against him. The government alleged that Lucchese had failed to disclose his complete arrest record during his citizenship application. In 1957, Lucchese and his associates sought to seize control of the Luciano and Anastasia crime families to gain dominance over the commission. This plan involved violent actions. On May 3, 1957, Vincent Gigante wounded Frank Costello, Luciano's street boss, prompting Costello's retirement and Vito Genovese's rise to power. Later, on October 25, 1957, Albert Anastasia was assassinated, leading to Carlo Gambino taking over the Anastasia family, later renamed Gambino. To legitimize his control over the Luciano family, Genovese convened a national mob meeting at the rural home of Joseph Joe the Barber Barbara in Appalachian, New York in 1957. However, on November 14, 1957, the New York State Police raided the gathering, arresting 61 fleeing gangsters. Lucchese managed to evade arrest as he had not arrived at Appalachian yet. Nonetheless, his consigliere Vincenzo Rao, along with Gambino, Genovese, and other mob leaders, were detained. Genovese's humiliation following the failed Appalachian meeting spurred a new alliance among Luciano, Costello, Lansky, Gambino, and Lucchese, leading to a plan to eliminate Genovese. Two years later, this alliance facilitated Genovese's arrest on narcotics trafficking charges. He was convicted and imprisoned, ultimately dying in 1969. With Genovese out of the picture, Gambino assumed control over the commission with the support of the alliance. On April 8, 1958, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the 1952 citizenship ruling against Lucchese due to a legal technicality. However, the very next day, U.S. Attorney General William P. Rogers initiated a fresh case against Lucchese. In 1963, Joseph Magliocco and Bonanno boss Joseph Bonanno devised a daring scheme to eliminate commission bosses Carlo Gambino, Lucchese, and Stefano Magadino, along with Frank De Simone with the intention of seizing control of the Mafia Commission. Magliocco entrusted the murder contract to Joseph Colombo. However, Colombo, either out of fear for his own life or recognizing an opportunity for advancement, instead disclosed the plot to the commission. Upon learning of the plot, the commission realized that Bonanno was the true mastermind behind the scheme. Consequently, both Magliocco and Bonanno were summoned to provide an explanation. While Bonanno went into hiding in Montreal, Magliocco, visibly shaken, appeared before the commission and confessed to everything. As a result, he was fined $50,000 and forced into retirement. Tommy Lucchese died of a brain tumor. The funeral drew over 1,000 mourners, a diverse mix that included politicians, judges, police officers, racketeers, drug dealers, pimps, and hitmen. Undercover policemen were present, documenting the attendees. Remarkably, at the time of his death, Lucchese had managed to avoid spending a single day in prison for 44 years. Let's talk about legendary mobster Anthony Corallo, also known as Tony Ducks. In the 1920s, Corallo became associated with the 107th Street Gang in East Harlem, marking the beginning of his involvement in organized crime. His first encounter with the law occurred in 1929 at the age of 16 when he was arrested for grand larceny, although he managed to avoid conviction. By 1935, Corallo had transitioned into the Gagliano crime family, which eventually evolved into the Lucchese family. Under the wing of underboss Tommy Lucchese, Corallo was recruited to collaborate with mobster Johnny Dio, who led labor racketeering operations in the Manhattan Garment District. In 1941, Corallo faced another brush with the law when he was arrested for possession of a narcotics cash valued at $150,000. Subsequently, he was convicted of narcotics violations and served a six-month sentence in the city jail on Rikers Island. In 1943, at a relatively young age, Corallo achieved the significant milestone of being appointed as a captain, gaining leadership of his own crew within the Lucchese family. Following this promotion, he relocated his operations from East Harlem to Queens. Alongside Johnny Dio, Corallo expanded his influence by gaining control over five local chapters of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Leveraging these paper locals, Corallo and Dio orchestrated advantageous deals with trucking companies while exploiting the rank-and-file chapter members for their own gain. From 1941 to 1960, Tony Corallo faced at least 12 arrests for various crimes. Yet remarkably, none of these cases progressed to trial. Tommy Lucchese, impressed by Corallo's uncanny ability to evade convictions, famously remarked, Tony Ducks again, earning Corallo the nickname Tony Ducks. In 1951, 
After the death of longtime boss Tommy Galliano, Lucchese assumed leadership of the family. On August 15, 1959, Corallo appeared before the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management. The committee sought explanations regarding the theft of $70,000 from Teamsters Union Local 239, allegedly orchestrated by Corallo using the names of deceased mob members. Like many other mobsters, Corallo invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, refusing to answer questions and pleading the Fifth Amendment 120 times during his two-hour interrogation. Tony Corallo faced indictment on charges of receiving kickback payments from a contractor involved in renovating the Jerome Park Reservoir in the Bronx. The former city water commissioner, James L. Marcus, also faced indictment due to his association with Corallo, which originated from loan shark debts. Corallo was convicted in the Marcus bribery case on June 19, 1968, and sentenced to three years in federal prison on July 26, 1968. During Corallo's incarceration, Carmine Tramunti was designated as interim boss of the Lucchese family by the commission. However, some historians suggest that upon Corallo's release from prison in 1970, he immediately assumed the role of boss, with Tramunti possibly serving as an acting or front boss for the following three years. When Tramunti was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison on May 7, 1973, Corallo solidified his position as the undisputed boss of the Lucchese family. As boss, one of Corallo's initial endeavors was to monopolize gravel distribution in various regions of New York, such as Long Island. By acquiring major gravel companies within his territories, Corallo expanded the Lucchese family's influence within the construction industry and affiliated unions. He then turned his attention to the garbage industry, establishing the Private Sanitation Industry Association with the assistance of union official Bernie Adelstein. With the backing of Lucchese Captain Paul Vario and his crew, Corallo extended his control to John F. Kennedy International Airport. In the early 1980s, Tony Corallo unwittingly became entangled in events that would ultimately spell the end of his criminal career. Alongside Salvatore Avellino, Corallo had established a firm grip on the waste hauling business in Long Island. To gather evidence against Avellino, members of the New York State Organized Crime Task Force enlisted the help of undercover informant Robert Kubeka, owner of a garbage hauling business in Suffolk County. Kubeka had long resisted mob control over the waste hauling industry, enduring extensive harassment since the 1970s. In 1982, Kubeka agreed to wear a surveillance device during meetings with the mobsters. Although he couldn't get close to Avellino himself, the information Kubeka collected eventually convinced a judge to authorize a wiretap on Avellino's home phone in Nisiquog, New York. While the wiretap yielded disappointing results for the agents, it did uncover the fact that Avellino spent his days chauffeuring Corallo around in his car. The Prime Minister Frank Costello had strong alliances with Carlo Gambino and Carlos Marcello. He aided Gambino in framing rival Vito Genovese on narcotics charges, resulting in Genovese's imprisonment for life. Costello also maintained a profitable relationship with New Orleans mob boss Carlo Marcello. Costello's banned slot machines were operating in Louisiana with Marcello's blessing. Additionally, Costello had a friendly rapport with FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Despite Hoover's public denial of knowledge regarding organized crime, suggesting awareness of Costello's connections to Gambino and Marcello. After the turmoil caused by the murder of Albert Anastasia in the Park Sheraton Hotel, Carlo Gambino and Carlos Marcello rose to the top of the national organized crime hierarchy. They transformed their families into massive conglomerates earning billions annually. Gambino, however, faced resistance from Tough Tony for suspected involvement in Albert's murder, resulting in withheld profits from waterfront rackets. Gambino knew that Tough Tony was old and was having health problems, and year later Tough Tony had a heart attack. Gambino eventually gained control over the highly profitable labor racketeering in New York. Federal investigators have concluded that Lucky Luciano, while in exile, facilitated Carlo Gambino's entry into significant heroin trafficking. Luciano recognized the rising demand for illicit drugs in America, envisioning it surpassing that for alcohol during Prohibition. He identified the potential for producing heroin from poppy seeds, which Sicily had been cultivating to a limited extent. Luciano devised a strategy to acquire poppy seeds from Turkey and process them into heroin in Sicily and pharmaceutical companies in Northern Italy. Transporting the final product to the United States was regarded as the most straightforward aspect of the operation. Ordered by Luciano, Carlo Gambino embarked on a risky journey to Palermo in 1948 to discuss the importation of heroin from Sicily into the United States. This posed a danger to Gambino an illegal alien liable for deportation. Discovery of his presence in Sicily could bar his return to the States. Traveling from New York to Canada with his brother Paul, Gambino then took a freighter from Toronto to Palermo, where he met Luciano as arranged, and agreed to aid in the heroin export to New York. 
Later he appointed his underboss, Joseph Joe Banti Biondo, to oversee the heroin smuggling operation. Federal investigators assert that Gambino's heroin trade became his second most profitable endeavor after gambling, with cargo hijacking operations at the waterfront and Kennedy Airport. However, within Carlo Gambino's ever-growing empire, there existed numerous legitimate and illegal ventures. This included involvement in the garment district rackets, among others. By the 1960s, a staggering 70% of all clothing sold in the nation originated from a compact seven-block region in midtown Manhattan. Immense wealth was being amassed and squandered within this bustling, chaotic hub of buzzing factories, frantic executives, crowded showrooms, and streets overwhelmed by double-parked tractor-trailer trucks, vans, and numerous hand-pushed racks of clothing. Carlo Gambino's son, Thomas, was married to Francis, the daughter of Tommy Lucchese. When Lucchese gained control of the Teamsters locals in the garment district, he appointed his son-in-law, Thomas Gambino, as a vice president of one of his trucking companies named Consolidated Carrier Corporation. With this strategic position, it was only a matter of time before Carlo expanded his influence over other trucking operations in the garment center. Thomas remained a powerful captain until he pleaded guilty to restraint of trade in a case brought against him by the Manhattan District Attorney in 1992. At that time, he owned the six largest trucking companies in the garment district and was estimated by the District Attorney's Office to possess a personal fortune of approximately $100 million. Carlo Gambino, a prominent figure by 1971, was characterized by his slender build and medium height, marked by a slight stoop in his walk. Despite his Sicilian heritage, he spoke English with a lisp, and his preferred Italian dialect was Sicilian, which was challenging for those from other regions to understand. Notably, he had a fondness for antique Sicilian poetry as his reading material of choice. Despite his affiliation with organized crime, Gambino was known for his soft-spoken and courteous manner, often described as kind, though he had some peculiar habits. One such habit was his constant nodding during conversations, leading to the nickname, The Nodding Don. As he aged, his distinctive long nose became more prominent, overshadowing his thinning face, which was perpetually adorned with a sinister smile. Gambino's ascent to power was primarily fueled by his intellect rather than sheer physical force. He was known for his cleverness and strategic thinking, always considering all angles before making a move. This intellectual prowess was his most formidable weapon throughout his journey to dominance. Carlo Gambino rose to become one of the most powerful mafia bosses in New York, but until Lucky Luciano's passing in 1962, Luciano retained the title of boss of all bosses despite living in Italy. Luciano's freedom was granted by the government in 1946 as a reward for his efforts in ensuring the safety of naval vessels on the mob-controlled New York waterfront during World War II, as well as for his role in persuading the Mafia in Sicily to collaborate with the Allies during the invasion of Nazi-held Sicily in 1943. Following the war, Luciano was released from prison and deported to Italy. According to Luciano's autobiography, Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello organized grand farewell parties in his honor, with notable figures like Carlo Gambino, Albert Anastasia, and Tommy Lucchese, among those who came aboard to bid him farewell. At the party, Luciano's was gifted $165,000 in cash. In October 1946, Lucky Luciano ordered a significant Cosa Nostra conference in Havana, consolidating the mob's control over all gambling casinos in Cuba and approving new smuggling routes for Sicilian heroin into the United States. The following year, in 1947, he authorized the murder of his longtime associate Bugsy Siegel at Siegel's Beverly Hills home as retribution for financial losses incurred in Siegel's Las Vegas casino venture. Witnessing his friends, including Frank Costello, facing scrutiny during the Kefauver hearings in the early 1950s, deeply unsettled Luciano. He was consulted after an assassination attempt on Costello by Vincent the Chin Gigante, advising a meeting of the commission to address the matter. Luciano received news of Albert Anastasia's murder while in his penthouse apartment having dinner. Following the Appalachian meeting debacle, Carlo Gambino, now a family boss, journeyed to Naples to confer with Lucky Luciano regarding their next steps. Prior to this, Gambino had already sought counsel from Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. Together, Gambino and Luciano devised a plan that successfully framed Vito Genovese. Genovese's imprisonment significantly increased the power of both Luciano and Gambino within the American Cosa Nostra. With Meyer Lansky alongside them, they effectively ran the organization without notable opposition. Regular communication and exchanges of messages and funds occurred between Gambino in New York and Luciano in Naples, illustrating their close collaboration. Despite their joint leadership, Luciano retained the final authority in resolving major disputes among the five families. 
In early 1966, Tommy Lucchese, the boss of the Lucchese crime family and a close ally of Carlo Gambino, was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer with a prognosis of three to six months to live. Lucchese's deteriorating health led to a mafia meeting held at a restaurant in Queens on September 22, 1966, which included 13 mobsters, including four family bosses. As Lucchese's closest confidant, Carlo Gambino asserted a caretaker's role over the Lucchese crime family's interests, a position that was accepted by the other attendees. When Lucchese passed away in July 1967, Gambino promptly appointed Carmine Tramunti as a figurehead successor and began overseeing the family alongside his own. With control over both the Gambino and Lucchese families and considerable influence over the Colombo family, whose boss, Joe Colombo, he had handpicked. Gambino's power within the New York Mafia grew significantly after Vito Genovese's death in prison. Gambino further consolidated his control by temporarily asserting himself as leader of the Genovese crime family. By 1970, Carlo Gambino had solidified his dominance within the New York underworld, emerging as the supreme figure in organized crime in the city. With strategic alliances, shrewd maneuvers, and astute leadership, Gambino had successfully expanded his influence and control over multiple crime families solidifying his position as the most powerful figure in the criminal underworld of New York. In the early 1970s, a significant event occurred within the Gambino crime family when Carlo Gambino's nephew, 29-year-old Emmanuel Manny Gambino, was kidnapped by a group of Irish mobsters from Hell's Kitchen called the Westies. Led by a volatile individual named James McBratney, these Irish hoodlums had been targeting lower-level associates of the Gambino organization engaging in kidnapping schemes where victims were held until a hefty ransom was paid, typically around $100,000. Negotiations for Manny Gambino's release stretched over several months, ultimately resulting in the ransom demand being reduced from $350,000 to $100,000, which was paid to McBratney. Carlo Gambino, who was already ailing at the time, anxiously awaited his nephew's safe return. However, Tragedy struck in January 1973 when the police, acting on a tip, discovered Manny Gambino's body buried in a New Jersey dump. Let's take a look at another Genovese mobster, Joe Adonis. Adonis assumed the position as an enforcer for Frankie Yale in the 1920s, who oversaw several illicit enterprises in Brooklyn. Adonis had a brief brush with Al Capone, the future leader of the Chicago outfit and a Yale alumnus at this period. Charles Lucky Luciano took on the position of Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseri as enforcer at the same time. Masseria became entangled in a brutal conflict known as the Castella Maris War against his rival Salvatore Maranzano, who represented Sicilian clans primarily hailing from Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily. As the war escalated, both sides began recruiting more members. By 1930, Adonis had aligned himself with the Masseria faction. As the tide turned against Masseria, Luciano covertly reached out to Maranzano, considering a switch in allegiance. When Masseria got wind of Luciano's intended betrayal, he approached Adonis with a plan to eliminate Luciano. However, Adonis chose to warn Luciano about the impending assassination plot instead. Adonis allegedly participated in the murder of Masseria on April 15, 1931. At a cafe in Brooklyn's Coney Island, Luciano set up a meeting between Masseria and himself. Luciano briefly excused himself from the meeting and left the eating room. Adonis, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, and Bugsy Siegel took advantage of the situation to storm the restaurant and shoot Masseria. Despite the incident, no one was ever formally accused in relation to Masseria's death. The conflict came to an end with Masseria's defeat, and Maranzano became the victor. Maranzano organized the Italian-American criminal organizations into the five families in order to avoid future confrontations, and he dubbed himself boss of all bosses. Luciano and his supporters, however, became unhappy with Maranzano's consolidation of power. When Luciano learned that Maranzano intended to have him killed, he took preventive action. In his Manhattan office on September 10, 1931, Maranzano was ambushed and killed by a group of armed men. Adonis and Luciano quickly established control over bootlegging operations in Broadway and Midtown Manhattan. At its peak, their enterprise raked in a staggering $12 million within a year and employed around 100 workers. Adonis expanded his ventures by acquiring car dealerships in New Jersey. At these dealerships, customers purchasing vehicles were coerced into obtaining protection insurance through intimidation by the salesman. Adonis diversified further into the distribution of cigarettes, amassing hundreds of vending machines stocked with stolen tobacco products. The nerve center of his criminal activities was Joe's Italian Kitchen, a restaurant he owned in Brooklyn. 
By 1932, Adonis had emerged as a prominent criminal force in Brooklyn. Despite his accumulated wealth, he still engaged in jewelry heists, harking back to his earlier days as a street-level criminal. Isidore Jaffe and Isaac Wapinski were abducted and brutally attacked in Brooklyn in 1932, according to rumors of Adonis. In 1931, Adonis had first provided financial assistance to these people, so they could make investments. But in 1932, he planned their kidnapping because he felt he should have a larger portion of the earnings. Adonis freed Juffy and Wapinski after a $5,000 ransom was paid after holding them kidnapped for two days. Tragically, Wapinski went away a month after the attack due to internal traumas he had received. Adonis extended his influence by enlisting the support of politicians and high-ranking police officials, who were added to his payroll. Through his political connections, Adonis exerted his sway to aid members of the Luciano crime family, including figures like Luciano and Genovese, as well as associates such as Meyer Lansky and Louis Lepke Buchalter, who led the notorious Murder Inc. serving as a member of the syndicate board. Adonis, alongside Buchalter, potentially played a role in assigning murder contracts to the infamous Murder Inc., an enforcement arm of organized crime. Charles Lucky Luciano received a 30-year prison sentence after being found guilty of pandering in 1936. The family was run by Vito Genovese, the underboss, until he fled to Italy in 1937 to avoid being charged with a murder. This led Luciano to name Adonis's close friend Frank Costello as head of the Luciano family, while Adonis gained control of the syndicate. On April 27, 1940, Adonis was indicted in Brooklyn for the 1932 Juffy Wapinski kidnapping, extortion, and assault case. However, the prosecutor later requested dismissal due to insufficient evidence on February 24, 1941. During the 1940s, Adonis transferred his gambling operations to New Jersey, driven by New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia's crackdown on illegal gambling. Adonis relocated his family to a lavish residence in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He established a casino in Lodi, New Jersey, providing transportation from New York City. Additionally, Adonis partnered with Meyer Lansky to run an illicit casino in Hallandale Beach, Florida. Luciano's goal was to re-establish mafia control through the Havana Conference in Cuba, which was held in December 1946, after his expulsion to Italy on February 10, 1946. Both Adonis and Luciano, who were in attendance at the conference, intended to use Cuba as a base to expand their operations. Luciano's ally Adonis consented to give him control over the syndicate. When Luciano's presence in Havana became known, the U.S. administration stepped in and exerted pressure on Cuba to expel him. Luciano was expelled from Cuba and sent back to Italy on February 24th, 1947.Adonis found himself in the spotlight on December 12, 1950, when he was summoned before the U.S. Senate Kefauver Commission on Organized Crime. He consistently invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, avoiding contempt charges but gaining unwelcome national notoriety as a mob figure. In late May 1951, Adonis and his associates entered no contest pleas in relation to operating gambling establishments in Lodi and Fort Lee, New Jersey. As a consequence, Adonis received a two to three year state prison sentence in Hackensack, New Jersey on May 28, 1951. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.